Hey guys, welcome back to my channel. And as promised, today is the day that I fill you guys in on what is on the CCMA exam. Here's a short reminder that if you guys are stuck on what the heck you even need to study for this exam or what is on this exam that you know you really need to review, then make sure you check out my previous video, which I'll link it right up here. I give you guys the exact resources that I used to learn, practice, and reinforce these concepts. As always, I tried to keep the intros short, so let's get into the actual reason about why you guys are here. What is on the CCMA exam? One, two, three, four. All right, so in this video, um, I'm gonna break up this video into bigger picture topics, and then we'll go a little bit into depth on what is in each of these sections. All right, without further ado, let's start off with our first topic, First, we're gonna be talking about injections. So first, you want to make sure you know your um, types of injections. So these basically include your intradermal, subcutaneous, intravenous, and muscular injections. So for your intradermal, subcutaneous, and muscular injections, make sure you know the needle gauges and um, the radius of these needles that you are using, because um, you're definitely gonna be tested on that on the exam. And also make sure that you know that subcutaneous injections are slow injections. So when you inject it, you're gonna inject it slowly um, compared to um, the other injections. Also make sure that you know the angle that you're gonna be injecting these injections. So for um, the muscular injection, for example, it's 90 degrees. Now one exception that you need to know about for this section is insulin. So insulin is a subcutaneous injection. However, when you are administering insulin to a patient, you have to know that it's actually in a 90 degree angle. So this is one of the exceptions. Um, subcutaneous injections are usually 45 degrees and muscular injections are 90 degrees. However, insulin, you will be administering it in a 90 degree angle, although it is a subcutaneous injection. All right, now let's move on to topic number two. We're gonna be talking about urine samples slash lab testing. Urine samples is gonna be uh, asked on your exam. So first on your exam, you might be asked about the chain of custody when it comes to urine sampling. Um, so one of the uh, things that you need to do is make sure that you seal the cup um, in front of the patient itself, like before the patient leaves, just so that the sample hasn't been disturbed. Um, you know, for example, if you're doing a drug test, you need to make sure that the sample hasn't been tampered with. Also, you need to know um, what temperature your urine samples need to be in order to be tested. So for example, um, at what certain temperature um, will the sample not be able to be tested on or will that sample be rejected? And also you should know that urine samples should not be sitting out for more than two hours because then the bacteria and the things inside of the urine could begin to degrade and it wouldn't be an accurate reading. Um, for that urine sample. And then also make sure that you know how to prepare patients for urine collection. So for example, if they need to do a clean catch midstream urine collection, make sure that you are informing the patient that they need to cleanse the area before they urinate. And also they need to urinate a little bit um, into the toilet and then do the rest of the collection into the urine sample cup. All right, now let's move on to topic number three. Let's talk about some charts that are gonna be used in this setting. So make sure you know about the Ishihara chart, which tests for color blindness, and also make sure you know about the Snellen chart, which is for visual testing. Make sure that you know what distance you need to stand at, which is about 20 feet. And also make sure you know what 2020 vision is. Um, 2020 vision is perfect vision. And then also make sure you know what 2050 vision is. There was a question about 2050 vision on my exam, and it was on many other people's exams that I talked to as well. So make sure you know what 2050 vision means. 2050 vision basically means what the normal eye can see at 50 feet, this person can see at 20 feet. 2000 vision is legally blind. All right, now let's move on to topic number four, which was the microbiology questions. Now, if I'm being completely honest, I didn't really um, study this section that much, so I completely guessed. But there's only two to three microbiology questions on my exam, so 
I think it can slide if you're on a time crunch. I would recommend just skipping over the microbiology section. But some examples of questions that were on my exam were, what disease does this bacteria cause? Syphilis and thrush were the two bacterias that were on my exam. So I would just recommend studying those two just because you know, you know they've been on a previous exam so they could be on a future exam. And then there was also like one question that asked, these symptoms are caused by what bacteria? So if you really wanna make sure that you know these, make sure you know um, the different types of bacteria and then the symptoms that these bacteria can cause. All right, topic number five, make sure you know all your diseases and their symptoms. So if you purchase the NHA study guide, which if you watch my video before, you'll know that I recommended that as a content review material. There's a section that basically outlines all of the diseases that you need to know. It also gives their symptoms and then some other um, additional information about the diseases, but just make sure that you're focusing on the diseases and their symptoms and you know how those are connected. All right, topic number six, let's talk about some pharmacology. So again, I would recommend um, NHA study guide to review the pharmacology and the different types of you know drugs and those kind of stuff but if you've already reviewed the pharmacology section you'll definitely know that albuterol is a bronchodilator so I'm gonna use that for this example so on the exam they're not gonna ask oh, is albuterol a bronchodilator? But instead, they'll ask you if a patient is having trouble breathing, which of these medications will you give them? And then the, one of the answer choices will be albuterol, so you will have to you know, use your critical thinking um, on this exam. Another example of a question that could be on this exam is what kind of drug is codeine and what does it do to the body? So you have to know um, what classification of in pharmacology that codeine is and then you'll also need to know what it does. All right, big picture number seven are conversions. Make sure you know these three conversions. So the first one is one kg equals 2.2 pounds. The second one is 15 milliliters equals one tablespoon. And the third one is five milliliters equals one teaspoon. All right, now let's move on to topic number eight, which is phlebotomy. This is one of the biggest sections along with EKG, which I'll be talking about right after phlebotomy. So make sure that you're really, really, really reviewing phlebotomy and EKG. So first we're gonna talk about phlebotomy and laboratory testing with phlebotomy. So so make sure that when you're starting the centrifuge that it is balanced. That's going to be a question on your exam or it was online. They basically ask like, oh, when you're using a centrifuge, like what is one of the first things you need to make sure um, happens? Also know your phlebotomy tube colors. This is another type of topic that the exam is going to test your critical thinking. They're not just going to ask, oh, what additive is in the blue test tube? But instead they'll ask you, for example, if a test is being run for PT or INR, what additive is going to be used? So first, you're gonna to need to know that PT and INR testing is usually used with the blue tube. Now you have to think what additive is in the blue tube. Oh, that's sodium citrate. So you kind of have to go through some steps in your brain to arrive at the right answer. All right, and then we have the venipuncture part of the phlebotomy section. So make sure you know like where you're gonna put the tourniquet. That's gonna to be three to four inches above the venipuncture site. Also make sure you know how and where to collect capillary collection for babies and for adults, make sure you know the differences. Also, there might be a question on your exam where it's like, the patient makes a fist and pumps how many times? One, two, or three. All right, topic number nine, we have EKGs. Make sure you know the types of interferences that can occur when you are performing an EKG. So for example, if a patient is trembling or shivering, what type of interference is it? Or um, if a phone is present and there is an interference in the EKG, what kind of interference would there be? All right, topic number 10 is anatomy. Now there isn't much anatomy on this exam. So if you're on a time crunch, I would suggest skipping over this section as well. But definitely if you have the time, I would study it. It's gonna help you. But if you're on a time crunch, just make sure you're gonna listen to what I'm about to say and then you should be uh, good to go for this section. So basically for the anatomy section, you need to know your four quadrants. So you have the left upper quadrant, the left lower quadrant, the right upper quadrant and the right lower quadrant. Also, you want to make sure you know what organs or main organs that are in these areas. So in the left upper quadrant, you're going to have your stomach and your spleen. 
In the left lower quadrant, you are going to have your uh, small intestine and your rectum and your anus. And then in the right upper quadrant, you are going to have your gallbladder and your liver. And then in the right lower quadrant, you're gonna have your sesum and your appendix. So that's really all you need to know for the anatomy section. So now let's move on to topic 11, which is medical terminology. So on this exam, they're gonna just directly ask you medical terms. So for example, they will say, um, if your kidney is inflamed, what is that called? And you're gonna need to know it's nephritis, for example. But they might be a little bit more in depth than than the example I just gave. But make sure you know your prefixes, suffixes, and root words. Um, I made a Quizlet on that as well. So as I said, make sure uh, you check the description in my other video and um, practice using that Quizlet and you should be good to go for the medical terminology section. All right, topic number 12 is nutrition. Make sure you know what kind of nutrients certain foods have. So for example, one of the questions that was in my exam was like, which of these foods has the most iodine? And again, I referenced the NHA study guide for this. Um, and it gives you a really good um, brief table on the main foods that you need to know and what are in each of these foods. All right, topic number 13 is positions for examination. Make sure you know the different types of positions and what they are used for. So for example, you need to know that the SIMS position is used for rectal examinations and then also know like for abdominal examinations, what uh, position is used and that kind of stuff. It takes a little bit of memorization, but overall I find it helpful to enact these um, different positions so that I can remember them in my head. So for example, like supine, um, I kind of think of spine and my spine is on the um, bed, so uh, my back is on the uh, examination bed. Um, and then for prone, um, my back is prone, so I'm actually laying on my stomach. Um, so I kind of remember it like that, so you can use some tricks like that to remember it, but overall just visualizing and acting can really help you uh, remember it. All right, topic number 14 is administrative assisting. So know when you should check insurance information for a new patient. That's gonna be before they even come in for their appointment. Also know after how long is a patient considered new for procedural coding. Also know before buying supplies, what should you fill out, like purchase order, invoice, or packing slip, that kind of stuff. Also make sure you know um, that a maintenance log is used to track inventory of medical supplies. All right, topic number 15 is scope of practice. This is another big section on this exam and just knowing what is in a medical assistant's scope of practice can actually help you eliminate a lot of answer choices. So one of the big things about scope of practice is know that you can refer um, patients to outside organizations and resources, but you cannot diagnose, treat, or give patient any information that you think might be right. You always need to refer to the provider and you can reinforce what the provider is saying, but you cannot um, diagnose or do any of that kind of stuff. So for example, one of the questions might be, if a patient has hyperglycemia, what can you do? Well, what you can do is you can refer them to the American Diabetes Association so that they can gain more information and have a support group of other people that might be going through the same thing. So basically just remember that if it isn't in your scope of practice, you need to reference a provider or a licensed practitioner. Now, what can you do? What is in your scope of practice? So how I remember this is I remember four R's, refer, reinforce, reflect, and record. So for refer, we just talked about it. You can refer a patient to an outside organization. And for reinforce, you can reinforce what the licensed practitioner is saying. And for reflect, you can um, reflect a answer to an angry or upset patient. So for example, if a patient is saying like, I'm so mad, like I've had to sit here and wait for 30 minutes, you can reflect and say, okay, sir, um, it looks like you are upset because you've had to wait for 30 minutes. Um, am I understanding that correctly? 
And then for record, you can basically record data, vital signs, lab testing, etc. All right, hopefully that is helpful in understanding um, what is in our scope of practice as a medical assistant. All right, the last topic that I have for you is processes slash hypothetical situation slash miscellaneous section. So one of the things is make sure you know how to collect throat cultures. So do you just tell the patient to open their mouth or do they have to extend their neck? So another example of a question that could be on the exam is a patient has ABN and requests a test. Um, you look in their bank account and they only have $5, but the test costs $10. Um, how much are you going to be collecting from that patient when they come in for their visit? Another question that you could be asked is if the kidney stops working, what is being affected? Is it the absorption, the metabolism, etc.? Also, make sure you know what acetone smelling breath means and what you need to do about it if you find yourself in a situation where there's a patient that has acetone smelling breath. Also make sure you know the four types of immunity and how you acquire them. One question that was on my exam was about breastfeeding. So breastfeeding is what type of immunity. And then lastly, make sure you know the difference between a pandemic and an epidemic. All right guys, well, those were all of the big picture ideas that I have for you guys today. Hopefully this gives you a better idea on what will be on your exam. And hopefully um, you guys got kind of like a review session on what you need to study, or maybe just reinforcing things that you already know. So good luck for your exam guys. I know you guys will do absolutely amazing. Again, if you have any questions, please leave them in the comments and I will get back to them ASAP. So hope you guys have a great rest of your day and I'll see you in the next video.